What is theology? Christian theology seeks to understand the God revealed in the Bible and to provide a Christian understanding of God's creation, particularly human beings in their condition, and God's redemptive work. With Scripture as its starting point, theology is most effectively developed by following a definite methodology. Theology as the study of doctrine, biblical, systematic, human culture context, contemporary, practical. Doctrine is simply statements of the most fundamental beliefs that the Christian has. Beliefs about the nature of God, about His action, about us, who are His creature, and about what He has done to bring us into relationship with Himself. They are the fundamental issues of life. Doctrine deals with general or timeless truths about God and the rest of reality. It is not just the study of history and also the very nature of God who acts in history. Theology is biblical. Theology is systematic. Theology is done in the context of human culture. Theology is contemporary. Theology is practical. The Necessity for the Study of Doctrine Far from being dry or abstract, Christian doctrine deals with the most fundamental issues of life. Who am I? What is the ultimate meaning of the universe? Where am I going? Doctrinal beliefs are essential to the relationship between the believer and God. Drawing near to God, one must also believe that He exists. Doctrine also includes the connection between truth and experience. Despite our value of immediate experience, experience is also affected by reality. It is therefore not simply a question of whether one shall believe, but what one shall believe. The starting point for the study of Christian doctrine, natural theology, tradition, the scriptures, experience. One of the questions that must be faced when we study Christian doctrine is the source from which our knowledge will be drawn. Natural theology. The created universe is studied to determine certain truths about God and about human nature. Tradition. Inquiry is made into what has been held and taught by individuals and organizations identifying themselves as Christian. The Scriptures The Bible is held to be the defining document or the constitution of the Christian faith. The Bible is the constitution of the Christian faith. It specifies what is to be believed and what is to be done. Experience the religious experience of a Christian today is regarded as providing authoritative divine information. The Method of Theology Theology is a science. That means, in part, that it has a definite procedure. There are nine developmental steps, the first being a collection of the biblical materials. The first step will be to identify all the relevant biblical passages dealing with the topic being investigated and then to interpret them very carefully. This process is called exegesis. It is important even at this step to think carefully about the materials being used. Who is the author and what are they saying? Such biblical inquiry will involve examination of various types of biblical material. The second step is unification of the biblical materials. It is important to learn what a biblical author says in different settings about a given subject. Doctrine, however, is more than a mere description of what Paul, Luke, or John said, and so we must draw these several witnesses together in some sort of coherent whole. It is the looking for agreement rather than disagreement between the authors of the texts. The third step is analysis of the meanings of biblical teachings. What does the Bible really mean? We need to be careful not to read contemporary meanings into biblical references. Also, some may simply assume that a concept such as being born again will be understood by everyone in the same way. Step 4 is the examination of historical treatments. One of the tools of theology is a study of church history. Here we are able to put our own interpretations in the context of how a particular doctrine has been viewed in the past. We can, therefore, often tell the implications of a current view by looking at the historical results of a similar view. The identification of the essence of the doctrine is step five. 
During this step, we must discover the underlying message behind all its specific forms of expression. We must ascertain the common truth about salvation that is found in the book of Deuteronomy and in the book of Romans. Step 6 is the illumination from sources beyond the Bible. The Bible is the primary source of our doctrinal construction. It is a major source, however, not the only one. God has revealed himself in a more general sense in his creation and in human history. Contemporary expression of the doctrine is step 7. The method of correlation is to inquire what questions are being asked by our age, the whole way in which the general culture views reality. This is how we relate the content of Bible theology. Step 8 is the development of a central interpretive motif. One does not need a basic central characterization of their theology, though it may be helpful. A motif can be a reflection of one's denomination. The way in which we characterize our theology is often related to our own personality and background. The final step is stratification of the topics. What are the major issues of theology? What are the subpoints or sub-issues? Major points deserve greater attention. A careful consideration of the relative significance of theological topics is essential. Contemporizing the Christian Message The Single Row of Musical Choices The idea of being contemporary. I grew up in a small farming community. It was a big day when we would travel to a nearby city to go shopping. The Christian bookstore was always a special stop for my mother. I found great delight in looking over the latest contemporary CDs in the music section. Mind you, this section was only a single row of choices. Contemporary at that time seemed to me the type of music played and whether or not you wore a three-piece suit to church or not. The acceleration of change and the explosion and fragmentation of information have made doing theology more difficult in today's world than was true in the slower-paced previous centuries. It is important to state the gospel message in terms that will be understood in the 21st century. The goal is to retain the content while making the message more understandable today. The Contemporary Context of Theology Church history varies in the way in which theology has been done. There have been periods of considerable uniformity. Today, however, there is considerable diversity. One characteristic of our time is the relatively short lifespans of theologies, from Augustine's synthesis lasting eight centuries to the theology of Karl Barth only lasting 25 years. There is a decline of great theological schools of thought. Now, far often, there are only individual theologians and theologies. Thus, one can no longer simply decide to espouse a ready-made system. As I write this, I am sad, struck in having so many individualistic views. One really must study to know what it is they believe. Again, there is no ready-made system. Although there have been significant nuances in theological approach through the centuries, the evangelicals' concern is simply to investigate what the Bible says on a given issue and unite that into some sort of coherent whole. Approaches to Contemporizing the Christian Message the world during biblical times versus today is drastically different. Modes of transportation is one such example. In biblical times, it was common to walk or to ride a horse or donkey. Paul's journeys throughout the Mediterranean area were an experience that very few equaled. The way in which various concepts are understood is quite different today from biblical times. The problem is how to express biblical truths in imagery that makes sense today. There are different types of approaches to the task of contemporizing the Christian message. One says we should present biblical concepts in biblical terminology, that it is the work of the Holy Spirit to make the message intelligible. No translating would need to be done. A second extreme approach is from a group known as the Transformers. They say that portions of the biblical view are obsolete and therefore must be eliminated. In the process of restating the Christian message, it may even on occasion be necessary to alter its essentials. The third approach rests in the middle of the previous two. 
The translators of the Christian message are conservative in that they desire to retain the essential content of the biblical teaching, while at the same time they desire to restate it or translate it into more modern concepts. To find contemporary equivalents for the concepts drawn from the biblical era. The Permanent Element in Christianity One theory holds that the permanent element in Christianity is institutional. In the Catholic view, an oral tradition which descended from the apostles has been entrusted to the Catholic Church. A second theory says that permanence is from experience. A third approach maintains that certain actions or a certain type of living constitutes the permanent element. Finally, there are those who insist that the permanent element is to be found in doctrines. The Nature of Contemporization and the Criteria of Permanence in Doctrine Doctrine is the unchangeable factor in Christianity. What we must do is to retain the essential meaning of the biblical teaching while we apply it in a contemporary setting. This is a matter of changing the form, but not the content of the teaching. We must determine the essence of the first century doctrine. We must also distinguish between the permanent or abiding essence of a concept and its temporary forms of expression. There are several criteria that we may apply to help identify the permanent factor. Constancy across cultures. Universal setting. A recognized permanent factor as a basis. Indissoluble link with an essential experience. Final position within progressive revelation. It is the biblical statements themselves from which we must draw out the essence, and they are the continuing criteria of the validity of that essence. The Big Word of Our Day Postmodern How do you define postmodern? Modernism, with its belief in the rationality of the universe, has been the hallmark of the 20th century. There has been growing dissatisfaction with the modern view. The result has been the emergence of the postmodern movement, which is affecting every area of intellectual endeavor, including theology. It is important for Christians to understand postmodernism and to construct a theology to evidence awareness of and response to it. Some aspects of postmodernism are compatible with and supportive of biblical Christian theology, while other parts are antagonistic. Christian theology needs to support and use the former while rejecting the latter. One part of the definition of antagonist is a muscle that counteracts the action of another muscle. One must learn postmodern thought if this thinking is an adversary to Christianity. Postmodernism defined Postmodernism is a movement away from the viewpoint of modernism. More specifically, it is a tendency in contemporary culture characterized by the problemization of objective truth and inherent suspicion towards global cultural narrative or meta-narrative. It involves the belief that many, if not all, apparent realities are only social constructs, as they are subject to change inherent to time and place. It emphasizes the role of language, power relations, and motivations. In particular, it attacks the use of sharp classifications, such as male versus female, straight versus gay, white versus black, and imperial versus colonial. Rather, it holds realities to be plural and relative and dependent on who the interested parties are and what their interests consist in. It attempts to problematize modernist overconfidence by drawing into sharp contrast the difference between how confident a speaker is of their position versus how confident they need to be to serve their supposed purposes. Postmodernism has influenced many cultural fields, including literary criticism, sociology, linguistics, architecture, visual arts, and music. When I googled postmodern, the mere result of images was 2,220,000. The postmodern period was characterized by a belief in the rationality of the universe. It generally held to a dualistic universe, which included a supernatural, or at least extranatural, dimension. The world has been created and is sustained by God, as in the Christian tradition, or some sort of spiritual beings exist behind and beyond nature, 
as in some polytheisms and pantheisms. Even non-religious traditional believed there was something beyond observable phenomena. History, as well as the pre-modern view, was believed to follow some sort of orderly pattern. John Herman Randall stated that modernism was essentially humanistic. The human being, not God, was the center of reality. And in a sense, everything existed for the sake of the human. The Nays Toward Modernism Gradually at first, but more rapidly of late, there has been growing dissatisfaction with modernism's way of viewing things. Diogenes Allen pointed out four areas of the breakdown of modernism. The idea of a self-contained universe is dissolving. The second collapse is the failure of the modern world to find a basis for morality and society. With the abandonment of traditional value, a virtual chaos has resulted, similar to the time of the Old Testament judges, when all that they did was right in their own sight. Optimism regarding inevitable progress has also been lost. The fourth Enlightenment principle to collapse was the inherent goodness of knowledge. These failures pertain to the more extreme elements of the modern period, elements that, whether intentionally or unintentionally, excluded the possibility and need of God. Whatever our exact description and assessment of the postmodern shift, we must acknowledge and admit that it is taking place and that the modern era is passing away. I thought the term for the next era as post-postmodernism was very interesting. Perhaps our class can come up with a better name for this next era. Positive, positive, positive. Principles of positive postmodern theology. How are we to learn from the insights of postmodernism? Part of the difference that being postmodern will make to our theology will be the way that theology is presented to non-believers. We are asking a dialogue partner to step into our views, and we must also step into theirs. We will want to bear in mind the limitations of our own perspective and recognize the need for correction when those limitations distort our understanding. It also means that globalization and multiculturalism are needed. It is important that we consult those of other countries, races, cultures, and genders. These groups may see an aspect of truth more clearly than the other simply because of its perspective. All of these perspectives need to be taken into account in formulating a theology that is true for all Christians. A postmodern evangelical theology will not limit itself to the writings of Western white male theologians. God's Revelation Revelation, noun, 1a, an act of revealing, b. Something revealed, especially a dramatic disclosure. The study of God's revelation of himself to humanity has been classified in two ways, general revelation and special revelation. The general revelation of God has been found in three areas, nature, history, and humanity. Theologians concerned with the comprehensiveness of general revelation have developed what is known as natural theology. This theology studies the way in which God's existence is known outside the biblical source, specifically through the use of reason. There is general revelation without natural theology, but the effect of sin prevents the unbeliever from coming to the knowledge of God. The salvation of the individual through God's general revelation can only be measured by faith. Humans are basically pea brains. All that to say, we are finite and God is infinite. We have an unbelievable opportunity to know him if he reveals himself to us. There are two types of revelation. General revelation is God's communication of himself to all persons at all times and in all places. Special revelation involves God's particular communications and manifestation of himself to particular persons at particular times. The three to remember in terms of general revelation are nature, history, and the constitution of the human being. Scripture states that there is a knowledge of God available through the created physical order. How awesome is that? The heavens are telling the glory of God. Psalm 19.1 In terms of historical revelation, 
God has been and continues to be at work in the world. Humans themselves are also part of God's revelation. In our moral and spiritual qualities, God's character is best perceived. Humankind also has a religious nature. The core of natural theology is the idea that it is possible, without a prior commitment of faith to the beliefs of Christianity, and without relying upon any special authority, such as an institution, the church, or a document, the Bible, to come to a genuine knowledge of God on the basis of reason alone. We need now to examine more closely several key passages dealing with the issue of general revelation and attempt to see exactly what they say. Then we can draw the meanings of passages together into a coherent position on a subject. God has given us an objective, valid, rational revelation of himself in nature, history, and human personality. It is there for anyone who wants to observe it. General Revelation and Human Responsibility All persons have an inner compulsion that there is something to which they ought to adhere, and they should reach the conclusion that they are not fulfilling that standard. In other words, the knowledge of God which all humans have, if they do not suppress it, should bring them to the conclusion that they are guilty in relationship to God. People need a more personal understanding of God than is available through nature and general history. God has provided particular revelation of himself. The modalities that God uses include historical events, divine speech, and the incarnation of God in Christ. Theologians have disagreed as to whether special revelation is propositional or personal. The Bible provides both cognitive and effective knowledge of God. By special revelation, we mean God's manifestation of himself to particular persons at definite times and places, enabling those persons to enter into a redemptive relationship with him. Why was special revelation necessary? The answer lies in the fact that humans had lost the relationship of favor which they had with God prior to the fall. It was necessary for them to come to know God in a fuller way if the conditions of fellowship were once again to be met. Note that the objective of special revelation was relational. When sin entered the human race, the need for special revelation became more acute. The direct presence of God, the most immediate and complete form of special revelation, was lost. The Style of Special Revelation The Personal Nature of Special Revelation First and foremost, special revelation is persona. God is all about relating to us as persons. God did this in a number of ways. God revealed himself by telling his name. God entered into personal covenants with individuals and with the nation of Israel. The whole of scripture is personal in nature. The Bible emphasizes a whole series of divine events by which God has made himself known. The second major modality of revelation is God's speech. A very common expression in the Bible, and especially in the Old Testament, is the statement, The word of the Lord came to me, saying. The prophets had a consciousness that their message was not of their own creation, but was from God. God does not merely demonstrate through his actions what he is like. He also speaks, telling us about himself, his plans, his will. I find that aspect of God thrilling. He is not passive in our lives, but active. Divine speech may take several forms. It may be an audible speaking. It may be a silent, inward hearing of God's message. There is a concursive inspiration. Revelation and inspiration have merged into one. As the authors of Scripture wrote, God placed within their minds the thoughts that he wished communicated. The most complete modality of revelation is the incarnation. The contention here is that Jesus' life and speech were a special revelation of God. The pinnacle of the acts of God is to be found in the life of Jesus. The miracles, the death, and the resurrection are redemptive history in its most condensed and concentrated form. Special Revelation Propositional or Personal Special revelation is both personal and propositional. 
God reveals Himself by telling us something about Himself. Special revelation is both personal and propositional. God reveals Himself by telling us something about Himself. We will talk further about the special revelation in the weeks ahead. Thank you for your time. This ends our first lecture.